Welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gisela Kay, and today we're going to look at two of the latest documents in the Idaho case. Now, more documents were filed, but these two that we're going to look at, I found the most interesting. If you want to look through all the documents, I have put the source to the documents in the description box for you. You can just click on that. It should easily take you to the site. It's the official court site for the Idaho cases of public interest. And there you can see chronologically all the documents that were filed. Now, this one is the objection to motion to stay proceedings. And the other one we're going to look through is one you've probably heard of already, which is all about the DNA. So I'll read through that for you as you guys commented on my YouTube short. If you haven't ever seen any of my YouTube shorts, please check out the shorts section as well. I mostly go live on this channel. So make sure that you are subscribed with your bell on because I don't have like a set schedule. I go live when there's news or when there's, you know, something for us to talk about or when my preparation on a case is done and we're ready to present it with a map time and everything. So make sure that you are subscribed so you don't miss out on those. Anyway, let's let's get started with this. Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like, and share. So this is the objection to motion to stay proceedings. So they say comes now the state of Idaho by and through the Lato County prosecuting attorney and objects to the defendant's motion to stay proceedings. For the following reasons, the defendant's motion should be denied. Now, who's the defendant? That would be Brian Koberger, the suspect arrested on December 30th, 2022, and charged with the murders of the four University of Idaho students who were murdered on November 13th, 2022 in the off-campus uh, college home in Moscow, Idaho. So that was within 49 days. They arrested him in Pennsylvania at his parents' house. And so there's been a lot of legal proceedings back and forth. At this point, they say the trial should start on October 2nd, and it's set to last for six weeks. So with Koberger here, having a motion to stay, that essentially means he's like, time out, you know, let's just pause all of this. And that has now been denied. Let me know in the comments what you think about that. So background, on May 16th, 2023, the defendant was indicted by a Latar County grand jury of four counts of first degree murder and one count of burglary. Three days later, on May 19th, the defendant filed a motion requesting release of grand jury materials under qualified protective order, motion to enlarge time to file pretrial motions and motion to make available the record of all proceedings of the grand jury. On May 26th, the state filed its response to the defendant's motion to enlarge time. The state noted that it did not object to the defendant's motion to enlarge time and went a step further by concurring in his request for additional time. On May 30th, the state filed its response to the defendant's motion regarding grand jury record and transcript and a proposed order for preparation and release of transcript and record of grand jury proceedings with conditions. As noted in that response, the state had also provided a proposed stipulation to the defendant's counsel on May 25th, after the parties were unable to reach an agreement as to the scope of grand jury materials that would be subject to release, the state submitted its supplemental response to the defendant's motions regarding grand jury record and transcript on June 6th. On June 13th, the defendant filed a reply to the state's supplemental response to the defendant's motions regarding grand jury record and transcript, addressing the substantive legal arguments that the state set forth in its June 6th supplemental response. So in that link that I'm putting in the description box, the source where these documents come from, oh, you'll see all those documents if you want to. Also, on June 13th, the defendant filed a motion to stay proceedings. The defendant asserts that he intends to contest the indictment. Uh, defendant's motion to stay part two and ask this court to stay this matter so that he may discover the grounds upon which to file a motion to dismiss related to how the grand jury was selected. In his motion to stay, the defendant re relies solely on Idaho Code 2-213. Argument. 
Defendant's reliance on that Idaho code is misplaced. That statute provides that a party can request a stay in the proceedings where there has been a substantial failure to comply with the applicable law in selecting the grand or trial jury. Under 2.213, a motion to stay must contain a sworn statement of facts, which, if true, would constitute a substantial failure to comply with this chapter. Only after the court determines that a substantial failure to comply has occurred can the matter be stayed. Upon motion filed under subsection 1 of this section containing a sworn statement of facts, which, if true, would constitute a substantial failure to comply with this chapter, the moving party is entitled to present, in support of the motion, the testimony of the jury commissioner or the clerk, any relevant records and papers not public or otherwise available used by the jury commissioner or the clerk, and any other relevant evidence. If the court determines that in selecting either a grand jury or trial jury, there has been a substantial failure to comply with this chapter, the court shall stay the proceedings pending the selection of the jury in conformity with this chapter, quash an indictment or grant other appropriate relief. As the plain language of the statute makes clear, a moving party must make a factual showing of substantial failure to comply with the statute, and only after a court makes a finding that such failure to comply occurred can the court stay the matter. Defendant's motion is deficient because he did not include a sworn statement of facts which, if true, would constitute a substantial failure to comply with this chapter. Rather than include a sworn statement with his motion, the defendant asserts in a footnote that Mr. Koberger will comply with the filing a sworn statement of facts in accordance with IC 22132 as soon as he has the grand jury record. Okay, so by including this promise to file a sworn statement in the future, the defendant implicitly concedes that his motion is deficient at the present. Because defendant has failed to comply with this key requirement for the Idaho Code 2213, his motion should be denied. And then they get just a little bit snarky here in the conclusion. The defendant asks this court to put the cart before the horse. Stay the case now, and the defendant will give the court a basis for the stay later. The court should decline to adopt this backward reading of the requirements of Idaho Code 2213. Defendant's motion should be denied. Respectfully submitted on this 15th day of June, 2023. Signed by William W. Thompson, Jr., the prosecuting attorney, and Ingrid Beatty, Special Assistant Attorney General. Okay, so now let's look at this document. It will take a while. I'll do my best to put some timestamps in with key moments. This is all about the DNA. This is a motion for protective order. It's the State of Idaho versus Brian C. Koberger. Comes now the State of Idaho by and through the Latar County Prosecuting Attorney and respectfully moves the court for a protective order pursuant to ICR 161 for information related to investigative genetic genealogy. This case arises from a quadruple homicide. Law enforcement found the DNA of a potential suspect at the crime scene, and the FBI submitted the DNA to one or more publicly available genetic genealogy services to determine potential relatives of the suspect. The FBI then used common genealogical techniques to develop a family tree leading to the defendant. The state seeks to protect from disclosure the names and personal information of the hundreds of innocent relatives on the family tree, the names of the publicly available genetic genealogy services used, and certain other information described below. The disclosure of this information is not required by Rule 16 of the Idaho Criminal Rules and should be protected from disclosure for the good cause described below, including the state's privilege to protect the identity of informers as described in Idaho Rule of Evidence 509. Factual Background On November 13, 2022, law enforcement found the bodies of Madison Mogan, Kaylee Consalves, Zana Kernodal and Ethan Chapin at 1122 King Road in Moscow, Idaho. All four victims died from apparent knife wounds. Law enforcement found a K-bar knife sheath on the bed next to the bodies of Madison and Kaylee. The sheath was face down and partially under both Madison's body and the comforter on the bed. Law enforcement seized the K-bar knife sheath pursuant to a search warrant. The Idaho State Police Lab in Meridian, Idaho located DNA on the K-bar knife sheath. The ISP laboratory determined the DNA came from a single source and that the source was male. 
Once law enforcement had single-source DNA from the K-bar knife sheath, they conducted what is called a short tandem repeat, STR, analysis. STR DNA analysis involves looking at 20 regions within human DNA and allows law enforcement to make a direct comparison between two STR DNA profiles. Law enforcement submitted the STR DNA profile obtained from the K-bar knife sheath to the combined DNA index system, CODIS, a database of STR DNA profiles from convicted offenders, arrestees, and crime scene evidence to identify the source of the DNA. No match was found. Unable to find a match using STR DNA analysis, law enforcement decided to use investigative genetic genealogy to find a lead. Genetic genealogy allows individuals to trace their lineage or connect with unknown family members using DNA. Typically, it involves sending a DNA sample, such as a tube of saliva, to a genetic genealogy service like Ancestry.com or 23andMe. If you are a member of this channel, I do believe my Ancestry.com results are on the members only playlist, I think. So the genetic genealogy service then creates a single nucleotide polymorphism SNP profile to use for genealogical purposes. A SNP profile is different than a STR DNA profile and is used more often for genealogical purposes. The genetic genealogy service then uses an algorithm to compare the user's SMP profile to SMP profiles submitted to the genetic genealogy service by other users to determine ancestry and potential relatives. The genetic genealogy service shares with the user a list of potential relatives and, depending on the specific genetic genealogy service, personally identifying information on those individuals, like their name, email address, and the amount of DNA the user shares with the potential relatives. The user does not receive any genetic information pertaining to other database users, i.e. the user's DNA profiles are not shared with each other. This same process, used frequently by members of the public, can also be used by law enforcement as part of the investigation, a technique referred to as investigative genetic Genealogy or IgG. Once a publicly available genetic genealogy service shows law enforcement potential relatives of the suspect, law enforcement applies traditional investigative and genealogical methods to build a family tree in an effort to follow the tree to the suspect or a close relative of the suspect. Family trees can be used to narrow down a potential suspect based on factors such as age, gender, opportunity, known physical characteristics of the suspect, etc. In this case, investigators used IgG to begin the process of developing a lead to the individual who left DNA on the K-bar knife sheath. The Idaho State Police utilized a private laboratory to develop a SNP profile from the DNA on the K-bar knife sheath. The private laboratory started using genetic genealogy to develop a family tree. But after law enforcement decided the FBI would take over, the private laboratory ceased its efforts and sent the SNP profile to the FBI. The FBI uploaded the SNP profile to one or more publicly available genetic genealogy services to identify possible family members of the suspect based on shared genetic data. The FBI could then view through the Genetic Genealogy Services portal, information regarding potential relatives of the suspect who left DNA on the K-bar knife sheath. Based on information, the FBI could see in the Genetic Genealogy Services portal. The FBI went to work building family trees of the genetic relatives to the suspect DNA left at the crime scene in an attempt to identify the contributor of the unknown DNA. The FBI built the family tree using the same tools and methods used by members of the public who wish to learn more about their ancestors. For example, the FBI consulted social media, viewed vital records such as birth and death certificates, and viewed other information already contained in the user portal for the genetic genealogy service, including unverified information submitted by other users of the genetic genealogy service. 
I think that's going to be a moment where the tinfoil hats come out, right? The FBI also consulted subscription-based databases available to law enforcement for information on individual people. The product of the genealogy conducted by the FBI was a family tree that contained the name, birth date, and death date, if applicable, of hundreds of relatives, as well as their familial connections between each other and the suspect, Brian C. Koberger. The FBI then sent to local law enforcement a tip to investigate the defendant. The IgG process pointed law enforcement toward the defendant, but it did not provide law enforcement with substantive evidence of guilt. The FBI did not, for example, conduct a direct comparison between the SMP profile from the K-bar knife sheath and the defendant's SMP profile. That type of direct comparison required the more traditional STR DNA analysis, which was conducted by the Idaho State Police, not the FBI. Prior to the FBI's IgG efforts, the ISP laboratory developed the traditional STR DNA profile from the DNA found on the K-bar knife sheath. After identification of the defendant, law enforcement recovered trash from the home of the defendant's parents. An ISP laboratory did STR DNA analysis of items from the trash for comparison to the unknown crime scene DNA. That comparison indicated that the DNA found on the trash belonged to the biological father of the individual who left the DNA on the K-bar knife sheath. Pursuant to a search warrant, law enforcement then collected DNA from the defendant via a buckle swab. A traditional STR DNA comparison was done between the STR profile found on the K-bar knife sheath and the defendant's DNA. The comparison showed a statistical match. Specifically, the STR profile is at least 5.37 octillion times more likely to be seen if the defendant is the source than if any unrelated individual randomly selected from the general population is the source. The genealogy conducted by the FBI resulted in a lead that pointed law enforcement to the defendant but it did not result in the creation of many documents or records. Much of the information relied on by the FBI was only viewed through the user portal in the publicly available genetic genealogy services and other investigative databases. The FBI did not download or create copies of those records. Once the defendant was in custody, the FBI removed the SNP profile from the Genetic Genealogy Services pursuant to the United States Department of Justice Interim Policy for Forensic Genetic Genealogical DNA Analysis and Searching DOJ Policy. This means the FBI no longer has access to view much of the information it used to create the family tree and cannot view it again without resubmitting the SMP profile to the Genetic Genealogy Services. To the state's knowledge, the only records that reflect the FBI's efforts to create the defendant's family tree is the family tree itself. Notes jotted down by the FBI agents as they constructed the family tree and any records created to document the removal of the SNP profile from the Genetic Genealogy Service or Services pursuant to the DOJ policy. The state has not seen nor does the state possess these records or copies of these records. Argument. The state seeks a protective order for a narrow category of information, namely information related to the use of IgG in this case. Idaho Criminal Rule 16 governs discovery in criminal proceedings. State versus ish 166 Idaho, all kinds of codes, right? Rule 16 is broad, but it is not a free fall. The rule contemplates the exchange of discrete categories of information between the state and the defense. As relevant here, the rule contemplates the state will provide three discrete categories of information. Any material or information that would tend to negate the guilt of the accused. Okay, any documents or objects that are material to the preparation of the defense, intended for use by the prosecutor as evidence at trial, or were obtained from the defendant or belong to the defendant and reports of scientific tests or experiments, if a defendant believes that he should receive information that does not fall within one of the discrete Rule 16 categories, the rule allows the defendant to seek an order from the court for information where the defendant can show a substantial need 
for the information in the preparation of his case. Here, the defendant served on the state a request for discovery that calls for the IgG information, even though the IgG information falls outside of the Rule 16 without first obtaining an order from this court. The state now seeks, and the court should enter an order protecting the information related to the use of IgG in this case. Specifically, the state seeks to protect the following information. The raw data related to the SMP profile, and the underlying laboratory documentation related to the development of the profile, such as chain of custody forms, laboratory standard operating procedures, analyst notes, etc. All information related to IgG efforts in creating a family tree and identifying the defendant's potential relatives, including the identities of the genetic genealogy services and the personally identifying information of the defendant's relatives. The state does not seek to protect and has or will disclose the following information. A genotype kit report from the private lab utilized by the Idaho State Police, which documents that a DNA test was performed. Information related to the STR DNA analysis conducted using the DNA recovered from the K-bar knife sheath and the DNA recovered from the defendant's parents' trash. Information related to the STR DNA analysis conducted using the DNA recovered from the K-bar knife sheath and the DNA recovered from the defendant via a buckle swab. This court should grant an order protecting the IgG information in this case because the IgG information does not fit into any of the discrete categories listed in Rule 16. And good cause exists to protect the information, including the need to protect the privacy of the defendant's relatives. A. Rule 16a does not require the disclosure of the IgG information because the IgG information is not exculpatory. Rule 16a of the Idaho Criminal Rules does not require the disclosure of the IgG information because the IgG information does not tend to negate the guilt or reduce the potential punishment of the defendant. The rule requires the state to disclose any material or information in the prosecuting attorney's possession or control that tends to negate the guilt of the accused as to the offence charged or that would tend to reduce the punishment for the offence. ICR 16a. As written, this rule largely mirrors the federal Brady requirement that the state produce to a criminal defendant all material exculpatory information. And they give a whole bunch of references, of course, but 16a and Brady are limited to exculpatory information. They do not require the prosecutor to make a complete and detailed account to the defense of all police investigatory work on a case. And then there's some more references as well. While the question of whether the IgG information must be disclosed as exculpatory is one of the first impression in Idaho, courts outside of Idaho have correctly decided that IgG information need not be disclosed as exculpatory. In the matter of Michael Green case, there's a case number, ruling on motion to compel production of discovery attached here to is Exhibit A. So remember, this is a reference to another case. In Green, law enforcement used DNA recovered from the victim's nightgown to identify the defendant as a possible suspect. I say again, this is a reference to another case because I already saw on my YouTube shorts that there's comments about Brian Koberger's DNA being found on someone's nightgown. No, they're referring to this Green case, okay? So C Green, they say, up to. Then they surreptitiously recovered items from the defendant's garbage that contained DNA and found through STR DNA testing that the DNA is the defendant's garbage matched the DNA found on the victim's nightgown. A saliva test then confirmed that the defendant's DNA matched the DNA on the victim's nightgown. The defendant moved to compel the disclosure of the IgG information. After an in-camera hearing, the court denied the motion. The court explained, The evidence that is material to the, the defendant's guilt or innocence is the testing that followed the IgG investigation, which directly compared a fresh swab of the defendant's DNA with a DNA profile collected from the victim's nightgown. It is only this evidence that the people intend to present at trial. The people are not obligated to provide its preliminary search of the genealogy databases for possible matches, which is investigatory in nature and is not exculpatory or material to the defendant's defense. 
As this case illustrates, the state is not required to disclose the IgG information under Rule 16a because the IgG information the state seeks to protect is not favorable to the defendant on the issues of guilt or punishment. The information provided to local law enforcement by the FBI was nothing more than a tip, a lead for local law enforcement to follow up on should they choose to. The genealogical tip did not provide or substantiate the defendant's guilt. Rather, the tip allowed local law enforcement to focus their investigation on the defendant and obtain independent material evidence of his guilt, all of which the state has disclosed or will disclose. Specifically, with respect to DNA, an STR DNA analysis found the defendant's DNA matched the DNA collected from the K-bar knife sheath. To the extent the IgG information has any relevance, the fact that it led law enforcement to the defendant means it is inculpatory rather than exculpatory in nature. Thus, Rule 16a does not require the disclosure of the IgG information because it's not relevant to and certainly not favorable to the defendant on the issues of guilt or punishment. B. Rule 16b-4 does not require the disclosure of the IgG information because the IgG information does not satisfy any of the required criteria. The nature of the IgG information is such that its disclosure is not required under Rule 16b-4. That rule requires the disclosure of books, papers, documents, photographs, tangible objects, and buildings or places only when they are 1. are material to the preparation of the defense, 2. are intended for use by the prosecutor as evidence at trial, or 3. were obtained from the defendant or belong to the defendant. 16b4. The IgG information does not satisfy any of these criteria. First, the IgG information is not material to the preparation of the defense. Defendant is charged with killing four people, not with being related to a particular person. The mere fact that uploading the complete SNP profile into a publicly available genetic genealogy service led law enforcement to relatives of the defendant does not affect the strength of the evidence against him. The strength of the evidence against the defendant in terms of DNA evidence depends upon the confirmatory result from the STR DNA analysis between the defendant's DNA profile and the DNA recovered from the K-bar knife sheath. As explained further below, the state intends to introduce the STR DNA analysis at trial and does not intend to enter any evidence pertaining to the development of a SNP profile or the tree building process for inculpatory purposes. The state has disclosed or will disclose the information it has related to the STR DNA analysis conducted in connection with this case. The immateriality of the IgG information to the preparation of the defense is perhaps best understood by way of analogy. The tip that came from the IgG process is no different than other types of technology hits that put law enforcement on the trail of a suspect. See United States versus Johnson 2011. For example, in Johnson, law enforcement recovered a suspect's DNA from a ball cap left at the scene of a bank robbery. Law enforcement ran the DNA profile through CODIS, which resulted in multiple hits, including the defendant. A scientist narrowed down the hits to the defendant, and law enforcement confirmed it was the defendant's DNA after acquiring a buckle swab from the defendant. The defendant moved to compel the other CODIS hits from the government, but the court denied his motion. The court explained that the DNA evidence material to the defense was the direct comparison between the DNA on the hat and the DNA taken directly from the defendant. The fact the defendant was first identified as a potential suspect based on a database search simply does not matter. Here the IgG information, like the initial CODIS hits in Johnson, is not material to the preparation of the defense because it only shows how the defendant was first identified as a possible suspect. Moreover, the IgG information could not support an argument from the defendant that law enforcement violated his Fourth Amendment rights by entering the DNA collected from the K-bar knife sheath into a genetic genealogy service. A defendant cannot prove a violation of the Fourth Amendment without first showing that he or she had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the place searched. State versus man. 
The K-Bar knife sheath was abandoned at the scene, as was the DNA inside it. The defendant cannot show that he had a reasonable expectation of privacy in DNA left at the scene of a quadruple homicide or in the genetic information of his relatives who voluntarily provided their own DNA to a genetic genealogy service. See Pyro vs. State. Okay, so then we go on there. Holding defendant did not have reasonable expectation of privacy in water bottle from which officers recovered DNA and observing that this court has found no case holding that a reasonable expectation of privacy should be determined by a suspect's desire to keep his or her genetic identity private. Additionally, the sheath and the defendant's DNA left on the sheath were seized pursuant to a valid search warrant issued by a magistrate judge, which means the law presumes that the search was reasonable. State versus Hutton. When a search is conducted pursuant to a warrant, the burden of proof is on the defendant to show that the search was invalid. Second, the state did not rely on the IgG information to establish probable cause for the defendant's arrest, did not present the IgG information to the grand jury, and has no plans to present the IgG information for which a protective order is sought as evidence at the trial. Instead, the state has relied on and will continue to rely on the STR DNA analysis comparing the defendant's DNA to the DNA on the K-bar knife sheath to establish the defendant's guilt. Again, the state has disclosed or will disclose information related to the STR DNA analysis conducted in connection with this case. Third, the documents and tangible objects encompassed in the IgG information were not obtained from defendant and defendant has no property interest in them. To the extent the DNA on the K-bar knife sheath once belonged to the defendant, he abandoned that DNA when he left it at the crime scene of a quadruple homicide. Defendant has never had a property interest in the records that reflect the SNP profile developed from the DNA on the K-bar knife sheath, nor has he ever had a property interest in the information gathered from the genetic genealogy services using the SNP profile, such as the information provided to the genetic genealogy services by the defendant's relatives. In short, none of the IgG information the state seeks to protect came directly from the defendant or currently belongs to the defendant, and thus Rule 16b4 does not require its disclosure. C. Rule 16 B5 does not require the disclosure of the IgG information because the IgG information is not the result of a scientific test or experiment. Rule 16 also requires the disclosure of information related to scientific experiments, but it only applies to limited information. Namely, Rule 16 requires the disclosure of results or reports of scientific tests or experiments made in connection with a particular case. ICR 16B5, emphasis added. The rule does not require the state to disclose what law enforcement does with the results or reports. Moreover, a process, procedure, or investigative technique is not a scientific test or experiment merely because it involves the comparison of information or objects or requires the use of logical reason. See State versus Matthews. Holding an officer's comparison of two keys did not constitute a scientific test or experiment because it was merely an observation of similarity between two keys. There were two types of scientific tests conducted with respect to DNA that fall within the purview of Rule 16b. First, law enforcement used STR DNA analysis to compare the DNA on the K-bar knife sheath to the defendant's father and then to the defendant. As required by Rule 16b-5, the state has provided the reports from those scientific tests. The state also provided other information related to the STR DNA analysis because the state plans on using that information at trial. C, e.g., for example, ICR 16b4. Second, the private laboratory developed the SMP profile from the DNA on the K-bar knife sheath. As required by Rule 16b5, the state will produce the report that documents that DNA test. Rule 16b5 does not require the state to disclose how the SNP profile was used and the genealogy by the FBI conducted based on the DNA information does not constitute a scientific test or experiment. 
The FBI submitted the defendant's SMP profile to one or more genetic genealogy services and were able to view potential relatives and access unverified data added by users in the genetic genealogy services. Starting with those potential relatives, the FBI engaged in traditional genealogy to put together a family tree that could lead them to the suspect. Putting together the family tree required the FBI to review sources such as social media, publicly available databases, subscription-based databases, vital records like birth certificates, census records, and historical newspapers. None of those actions can accurately be categorized as a scientific test or experiment. The product of the FBI's efforts was a family tree comprised of hundreds of the defendant's relatives. Put simply, the family tree created by the FBI cannot accurately be described as the results or reports of scientific tests or experiments and thus falls outside of Rule 16b-5. Good cause exists for this court to enter an order protecting the IgG information and if necessary, the court should hold an in-camera hearing. The mere fact that the IgG information does not fall within Rule 16 is reason enough for this court to enter an order protecting the IgG information. But the state is not seeking the protection of the IgG information as an exercise in obstinance. Instead, the state seeks to protect hundreds of innocent civilians from having their personal information, including their names, birth dates, and familial connections to the defendant in a high-profile quadruple homicide from being disclosed. That's valid. Very valid. The disclosure of the IgG information risks harm not only to these indirect informants, but also to the genetic genealogy services used by the FBI and the IgG investigative technique. This court should follow the procedure laid out by Idaho's appellate courts to determine whether the IgG information must be disclosed. And then there's some footnotes here as well where they say similarly the family tree created by the FBI cannot accurately be categorized as reports of memoranda made by a police officer or investigator, ICR 16B8. And the FBI has indicated that they did not create reports or memoranda as they conducted the genealogy. Even the notes jotted down by the FBI agents or the family tree constituted reports or memoranda as explained above. Those records are not in the possession of the prosecuting attorney. Providing the IgG information would require the disclosure of the identity of informants and prejudice the state. The process used to collect the IgG information required gathering information from several informants, including the genetic genealogy services to which the SMP profile was submitted and, indirectly, from the relatives of the defendant who hit on the SMP profile. Pursuant to Rule 16, disclosure must not be required of an informant's identity unless the informant is to be produced as a witness at a hearing or trial. ICR 16G2. The state has no intent of presenting the IgG information for which a protective order is sought as evidence at a trial, which means none of the IgG informants will be produced as witnesses at trial. The non-disclosure of this information is consistent with the state's privilege to refuse to disclose the identity of a person who has furnished information relating to or assisting in an investigation of a possible violation of a law to a law enforcement officer. As a general matter, we protect the identity of informants, the US Supreme Court has explained, to encourage the flow of information concerning the commission of crimes to law enforcement, McGray versus Illinois. Such communications are discouraged of the informer's identity is disclosed. The court's words, written long before SMP profiles were used for investigative purposes, apply with particular force to IgG information. Both the genetic genealogy services to which law enforcement agencies submit a suspect's SMP profile and the customers of those genetic genealogy services who may unknowingly be related to a suspect would be less likely to make the information available if courts start requiring the disclosure of the information in criminal cases, especially in high-profile criminal cases. See Green Op 11. Protecting IgG information in part because the court retains wide discretion to protect against the disclosure of information that might unduly hamper the prosecution or violate some other legitimate governmental interest. Two, this court should follow the process laid out by Idaho's appellate courts to determine whether the IgG information must be disclosed. Rule 16 allows this court to enter a protective order for good cause, ICR 16.1. If the court finds it necessary to review evidence in camera to decide whether disclosure is required, the rule itself allows the court to do so. 
the rule expressly contemplates that in deciding whether to enter a protective order, the court may permit a party to show good cause by a written statement that the court will inspect ex parte. It's, if relief is granted, the court must preserve and seal the entire text of the party's statement. ICR 16.1. Thus, Rule 16, standing alone, provides this court with the tools it needs to review evidence in camera. If the court decides it cannot enter a protective order based on this brief alone. Idaho's appellate courts have to further explain the process district courts should use when faced with precisely this issue, the need to protect both the state's interest in non-disclosure of the identity of its informers, McGray, and defendant's right to receive exculpatory information, see example State v. Wilson. In Wilson, for example, the court explained that this situation calls for a two-step process. First, the defendant must make a threshold showing that the informant may be able to give relevant testimony. Wilson, 142, Idaho at 435. If the defendant successfully makes that showing an in-camera proceeding, then provides an opportunity for the state to show that the informant's knowledge is not of such relevance that disclosure should be ordered. ID, see also State versus Farlow. Relying on Wilson to explain the same two-step process, once the trial court has concluded the defendant meets the initial threshold showing, it must then conduct the in-camera examination. Further, the Idaho Supreme Court has confirmed that it is desirable and proper to hold such a in-camera hearing before ordering or denying disclosure. So maybe they'll have an in-camera hearing, State versus Hosey. Even if this court finds that the IgG information falls within Rule 16, this court should follow the guideposts that Idaho's appellate courts have planted for the protection of informants. The defendant should be required to first establish that the IgG information is in fact relevant to the charges against him. If he can do this, this court should allow the state to present information at an in-camera hearing for the court to determine whether the IgG information must be disclosed. Wilson, 142 Idaho, whole lot of numbers and codes, explaining the in-camera presentation ordinarily may be in the form of affidavits, but allowing the trial court to examine witnesses as well as if the trial court deems it necessary. Conclusion. Based on the above, the state respectfully prays for the court to enter an order protecting the IgG information from disclosure as it falls outside the purview of Rule 16. In the alternative, if the defense can establish the IgG information is in fact relevant, the state asks this court to conduct the requisite in-camera hearing for the state to present information related to the IgG information and then enter a protective order under ICR 16.1 that the IgG information is not subject to discovery and need not be disclosed by the state. So basically, after all that, they want to protect all the others on the family tree is what I'm gathering. Let me know in the comments below what you're gathering. Okay, so we can see that everything is signed here. Now the rest of this document is about this other case, Michael Green, and they're giving examples of exactly what they just spoke about, you know, same as using the DNA ancestry type of website, how they developed that DNA profile, why an in-court hearing, in-camera in-court hearing might be necessary and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not gonna read through all of that because there's no real reason to. We've read through everything here now. That's just an example to really make sure that their argument is solid of like, see, this is how we normally do it. This is how it's been done before. Look at this case, look at this case, look at this case. If you do want to read the whole document though, it is available on that link I'll put in the description box for you. So after reading all that, do you think Brian Koberger is so busted, even though he's still innocent until proven guilty in a court of law? Or do you think there's any possibility that that DNA that was found on that knife sheath got there some other way? Do you think he was framed? Do you think he was set up? Do you think maybe, I don't know, let me know what you think. I would love to hear your thoughts. Other than that, I'm going to give my voice a little bit of a rest now <laughs> and I will see you again for the next one. Thank you so much. Stay safe.